going to have you turn to Mark chapter 5, and we're going to do a little teaching this morning. Yay! <laughs> I love it. I mean, you know, there's no important word than the Word of God. Something sometimes people don't realize, and I know many of you do, but sometimes I know we have visitors today. And different ones that uh, have come, and maybe you're just not doing it. But the word works for those who work it. The scripture says those who those that are doers will be blessed in what they do. And uh, sometimes I know, uh, depending on your background, but I mean around here, if your background, excuse me, is is more uh, word of faith or Pentecostal, whatever it is, um, you know we enjoy and and should enjoy and like services that are more you know, tangible in the sense of, you know, uh, like when we had Jim Hockaday here, people feel the anointing and hands are laid on people, stuff like that. Um, We tend to think that that's more uh, somehow powerful than just doing the word on a daily basis. But the reality is doing the word on a daily basis is powerful. The reality is if we would do the word on a daily basis, oftentimes we wouldn't actually need somebody to lay hands on us. <laughs> I know, it's just getting good already, isn't it? People say, shouldn't we go back to the children's ministry? When, uh, <laughs> that was the warm-up. <laughs> no, but if, if you'll do the word, you'll see that it's true. You'll be blessed. You know, if you just walk in love in your house, you'll have less strife. And just by doing that, you know, sometimes people are rebuking the devil and not doing the word, and it's just, it's not doing you any good. Because the devil knows that you're, you're uh, double-minded in your thinking. So if you rebuke the enemy, but then don't do the word, you actually leave the front door open with a welcome sign for the enemy. But if you rebuke the enemy and then do the word, you actually shut the door and double bolt it. To his attack. Because how many know he can come and knock? Did you know that? People say, oh no, no, I can't be tempted. Well, you can. Just like Jesus was. But you can overcome. You know, I've heard people say, in years past, you know, I had somebody say to me one time, I'm not even aware there is a devil. And I thought, you must be walking with him. Because I'm aware. (laughs) Some people say, well, I I was doing fine in my walk with the Lord until I started hearing the word and actually doing it, and then all hell broke loose. You notice that, huh? People say, well, what am I doing wrong? It's not the issue. If you're doing the word, it's what you're doing right. You just found out that there's there's an enemy out there that wants to stop you. Because he doesn't want the word of God to manifest in fullness in your life or in any believer's life. He remembers what Jesus did to him. He remembers through the ages what those that have submitted to God did to him. And did through the power of the resurrection. The wonderful thing about this is, is I'm not the power and neither are you. This is where faith comes in. Specifically, we're talking about the language of faith. And we're talking about the power of the tongue. We've talked about several things through this series. And and they all add up to where we're at right now. And we're going to have a few more teachings on this um, from the scriptures. But we've seen that how faith comes, what faith is. We've seen that whatever is in fullness in your heart will actually come out of your mouth. The scripture says, Jesus taught out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How many have been under pressure and you said something and you thought, where did that come from? You, it came from you, <laughs> came from me, okay? How many of you have been in the middle of a situation and, and you thought, you know, I got a pretty good handle on the way that I think and my temper? <laughs> right? <laughs> Brother Hagin used to say this to us, and, and I refer to him, but it's where we went to Bible college, and it proves it out in the scripture. But he said, you know, there are a few times I thought I got to the point where I was walking in love perfectly. He said, and then something happened that knocked my head where my feet were just a few seconds ago, and I realized I had some more growing to do. 
How many ever felt like your head got knocked where your feet were just a few seconds? And how many have had this thought come right afterwards? And the, and you, and the word says this, and the word says this, and, and, and you were doing that, so why did this happen? Am I the only one? See, you're not alone in this. This is reality. You say, what do you mean reality? I mean, it's the real contradiction, the real fight that we live in in this world. The real fight we live in in this world is a fight of faith. It's not a fight of flesh. And there are two spirits operating, two spiritual forces operating in the earth. One of them is Satan and his demons. And they're in full operation. And the other is God and his angels and the Holy Spirit. And they're in full operation. Depending on what we yield to, we either have a fight of victory or a fight of defeat in this. People say, well, what about the nature of the flesh? Well, I'll just put it to you like this. If the enemy didn't tempt your flesh, you wouldn't have much of a problem. I know the nature of the flesh is fallen. I get that. But it's ignited or it's activated through thoughts that come to you. And sometimes people think, you know, they'll make the statement, uh, 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 I don't know where these thoughts are coming from. Well, if they're stealing, killing, and destroying, if they're outside of peace, if they're outside of resurrection, if they're outside of who God is and what he said about you, then they're the enemy. And people say, well, that's not what my psychologist said. I know. Your psychologist is your psychologist. I'm talking about God. <laughs> and Dr. Jesus said, I know Dr. Phil's smart, but Dr. Jesus is smarter Okay, and this is a spiritual battle that we're in, so we need to realize that. So what does this have to do with the language, language of faith? Well, what you say makes a difference because you either are speaking in alignment with God or you're speaking in alignment with your enemy or your flesh, if he can get those two to work together. And if you do, you'll actually lock yourself up into the bondage that you're in. So uh, this morning uh, during Bible study, Herb was teaching. And he's talking about, it's a good series, you should go back and listen to it. He's almost done, he's getting there. But uh, it's a good ser series and he's talking about who are you. And I actually wrote in my notes as he was teaching, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, anything that you think or believe about yourself that's outside of what I said about you is a lie. Now that can be a tough pill to swallow. But you got to ask yourself the question, who's right you know, we do this as Christians. We receive Christ, and we know that he's our Savior and our Lord, and we know that when we die, we'll go to heaven, and, we, and much of the church is very strong on that fact. But then oftentimes, through religious teaching or just lack of understanding, we read through the rest of the Bible as if it doesn't apply to where we are today. And this is a dangerous thing. Now, if you're born again and you have Jesus in your heart, you get the most important thing done. But beyond that, there are truths that you can walk in from the Scripture on a daily basis that will help you overcome the works of the enemy in your life and the deeds of the flesh that have conquered you or ruled you for years. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be an addiction to a chemical. It could be an addiction to a TV show. It could be an addiction to Mountain Dew. It could be depression. It could be anything that steals, kills, or destroys. Anything that has a control on you. It could be a temper issue. It could be a relationship issue. It could be any of these things. I mean, I could go down the line. There's a lot to choose from. How many realize there's a lot to choose from in the world? Okay? And so we have to make a decision within ourselves by the Spirit of God and by the leading of the Word of God first, which one are we going to choose? Are we going to choose life or what? Death. Jesus, or the Lord said this in the Old Testament. Excuse me. He said, he said, behold, I set before you what? Blessing in. And then he said what? Therefore, choose life. He didn't say, therefore, I will choose for you what you are. Did he? He said, choose life. Uh, years ago, uh, uh, my brother-in-law had a youth group, and I think he, or he was involved in a youth group. And the name of the youth group was Option A. And it was based on that scripture. Choose life. So God not only tells you that you get to choose, but then he tells you what to choose. So he, it's, a, it's a test with the answers in the test. It's open book. 
right? How many like open book test? Okay. All this is an open book test that you're walking through. But the enemy came against me in this way. Well, what does the, what does the book say? And then you need to put that in your heart through reading it and absorbing it, listening to it, and then doing it, speaking it. All right. So we've been talking about speaking. And what I want to do is just put, uh, give you some uh, examples here from the Scripture. Hopefully we'll get to the book of James. Maybe not. We'll see what happens. But give you some examples here from the Scripture that basically combine the idea of faith in the heart and the expression of that faith. So I'll put it to you like this. What these verses will do will combine what we've talked about already. And people say, well, I wasn't here for the other messages. Well, you can go online and listen to them and then kind of, you know, go back and catch up where, where, where you uh, didn't hear it uh, and, don't, and don't quite see the full truth of it yet. We've pretty much, how many, real, how many you're convinced that have been here that your tongue is pretty important and you better watch what you say? Okay. If, if you didn't get those scriptures and you didn't hear that, you can go back and listen to the last two or three messages. We went through Proverbs, and there, and I didn't even give you all the scriptures in Proverbs that are available that talk about the tongue and, and the importance of what, you, what we say and different things like that. I didn't even get through all of them. But there are many in there. And so uh, you can go back and listen to that. The other thing uh, that we looked at is that you, what you put in your heart will come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we jokingly say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth leaks. Because it does. So you want to be careful what you put in you, because it's going to come out of you. Amen? And I'm not telling you you have to become a monk and live on a mountain. It's tough to spread the gospel when you're around no one else. (laughs) You know what I mean? People say, "I'm, I'm very religious. I just stay by myself all the time. You're so religious, you haven't read Mark 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, people think, well, no, the end is coming. Armageddon, I need to buy a bunker. That's not what Jesus said to do. Should I meddle there? I'm tempted. (laughs) Well, Trump's not in again. I got to go. No, 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 stop it. (laughs) Yeah. I did it anyway. (laughs) No, that's not what he said. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say, hide in a bunker. Well, I'm going to do it. Well, you can, and you can choose what you want to do, but that's not the way Jesus would do it. Amen? He wouldn't hide out forever. You know, there are times he hid himself, but it's just for seasons. How many know the Holy Spirit is uh, in, in the chess game of life is about a, 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 well, he's already to the end of the game with Satan. He's already won. It's already over. It's done. Amen? So Mark chapter 5, let's go there, if you're not already there, and let's look at this being put together about uh, faith in the heart and words being spoken. This is the woman with the issue of blood. Most of you have heard this testimony or heard this, uh, I guess, passage from the scriptures that Mark recorded about Jesus' ministry and what took place. Mark chapter 5, verse number 25 says this, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Verse 26 says, And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. Do you know that still happens till today? I know our medical science world has come a long ways, and I'm thankful for them. I'm not against medicine by any means. I'm not against doctors, nurses, any of that, or those provisions that have been made. I mean, you know, God's not out hurting people. Man gets in there and does things that they shouldn't, you know, for the love of money and stuff like that. But the reality is, is that a lot of the inventions and the things that, well, all of them that have saved lives came from the Lord. They just come into a system where they can be manipulated and and abused. Amen? Amen. But that doesn't mean all doctors are of the devil. Amen? It doesn't mean all lawyers are of the devil. It doesn't mean all preachers are of the devil. You pick your profession. There are people that are good there, and there are people that are not good. And that is a, that is a manifestation of the heart, not a manifestation of God's will necessarily. Amen? So we have to separate that. Because sometimes people put way too much. Uh, they give God credit for things that he had nothing to do with. And so we need to be aware of that. 
So she didn't grow better. She actually grew worse. And what we know from at least some from history is that um, it's not possible to know exactly what the issue of blood was. But the traditional suggestion is the best, namely an abnormal bleeding from the womb. This is what she probably had. Such a condition would have been physically debilitating. So she's bleeding constantly. So she's got to be weak. And she's been bleeding for 12 years. Apparently not enough to just bleed her out, so to speak, okay? Um, But enough to make her weak and sickly. And so Luke, who appreciated the limitations of a physician, said in Luke 8.43 that she could not be healed by anyone. Do you know that actually physicians don't heal you? They assist in the healing process that's already within your body. There are people that say, well, I don't believe in healing. Well, but they believe in God, and God created your body. We'll cut your finger and see what happens. Will it heal? Why? That's the residue of God within the makeup of what he created. Amen. And you say, well, what needs to happen then in my situation? You need God's power to get into what's already there to speed up the process. And that's accessed by faith. Amen? Okay. So when she heard about Jesus, you should underline heard about Jesus in your Bible if you want to. You don't have to write in your Bible if you don't want to, but I do. I went to a Bible school where the head guy said, if you have a Bible you can't write in, throw it away and get you one you can. People say, oh, throw away the Bible. He just did it for shock effect. Because I tell you, if you don't want to write in your Bible, that's fine. But I would underline that. She heard about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she what? She came behind him, verse 27. This is Mark 5, 27. In the crowd and did what? Touched his, his garment, his clothes, whatever your translation says. So she heard something about Jesus, and then she went to what? Moving toward Jesus. You see that? She heard something about Jesus, and she took an action. What must she have heard about Jesus that caused her to get up from where she was in her sickly condition And move toward him. Looking for healing. What did she hear? She heard Jesus heals. That's what she heard. Now my Bible says he's the same. See, when you hear something about Jesus and faith rises within you, then you should act on that truth. People say, well, don't I have to you know, know more about Greek and Hebrew in order to understand this? No. This is it. Well, that's not very deep. It's deep enough. Well, I need to know more of the history. Well, you can study out the history if you want to, but the reality is she heard something about Jesus. She got up and moved, and Jesus met her where her faith was. And Jesus made good on his word and who he is. She heard and accepted as truth that Jesus could heal what the doctors could not. She heard about what Jesus was doing. She heard the reports about Jesus and the miracles and healings. She heard with an open heart and received the word which produced faith. From this faith, she walked to Jesus and touched his garment. She walked to Jesus sick and walked home healed and full of strength. (laughs) Amen. It's good, isn't it? Verse 28, for she said, what are we talking about? The language of faith. For she said, so not only did she hear about Jesus but, and, and got up and walked, but also she heard about Jesus and did what? She spoke. She said, I, I hear, I've heard that Jesus heals. 
And when she heard that within her, began to stir these words and this faith. And then what came out of her mouth was this. If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. She put expression to her faith and then action to her words. Amen? She heard Jesus heals. She spoke out of her heart what went into her heart when she heard Jesus heals. Faith came into her. Out of that faith, out of the abundance of that faith, that word that was in her, it began to stir up. And out of the abundance of her heart came words. And what followed her words? Actions. Now, I know the way that it's recorded, it looks backwards to that, but it's actually not. This is actually uh, the words were spoken first, obviously. That's what motivated her. And we'll see this in the book of James. We'll see that in the book of James, Jesus actually, or James actually says by the Holy Spirit, and these are the Holy Spirit's words, that your tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth, and your tongue is like a rudder on a ship. Or, as you would say it today, because probably most of you don't ride horses. That was a mode of transportation in that day. They understood that more. Or, most of you don't usually get on a ship and go to work. Where you, you know, around here anyway. Have you noticed we're not surrounded by water in Montana? If you have oceanfront property here, you're lying. You would say today that your tongue is the steering wheel to your body and your life. So as you read the scripture, faith comes, and as faith comes, you hear that word, you begin to speak what God said, and it actually directs you physically and your circumstances. Isn't that powerful? People say, are you sure? Well, he's sure. Well, I just don't believe it. It'll work for you that way. People say, well, I don't believe in that. You can say into the mountain and it'll be removed. And your mountain's still there. Because you believe that part of it. You can speak your faith or you can speak your fear, but both of them will work. The principle of speaking works either way. Amen? People say, I don't know about that. Well, then go back to the Word and look. What do you mean? You mean you don't believe the Bible? Well, then I can't help you. But if you believe this, especially if you believe it in one part, why not believe it in the rest? The Scripture says all of the promises of God unto us are what? Yes, in Christ Jesus, right? Well, if you're in Him... Why not eat the rest of the loaf? People are like, no, I only like the ends of the bread. <laughs> you say, are, is this deep or what? I mean, this is spiritually deep. Eat the whole loaf. I'm just going to say this to you. You're not going to gain extra weight physically... If you eat all of it, you'll, be thorough, you'll have thorough amounts of nutrition within you. You won't lack any spiritual vitamins if you eat the whole loaf. Don't make this about a denomination. Don't make this about your favorite preacher. Don't make this about whether you like my style or not. Don't make this about whether you're a visitor just visiting because the children's program you know, had something today. I'm thankful that they did so I could get a shot at you. Sorry, I'm just too honest for this. I, I can't. I'm, <laughs> this is just how I do. And I'm okay with me. So it, I sleep well at night. Actually, the Lord just wants a shot at you. You know, if, if you can go back to the scripture and say, oh, no, 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 I can prove you wrong by the scripture. Okay, then I'll accept it. But this isn't about, you know, uh, church history or you know, what some denominational founding fathers said, Jesus is right, and founding fathers are right in areas, and humanity is right when they agree with God, but God is right in everything. Man can miss it. And I'm including myself in that. I could miss it. Yeah, I realize that. But if the scripture says it, then we need to believe it. Now, I'm going to prove this to you even more, because this is what Jesus said. 
Notice now we see that when she heard and received into her heart concerning Jesus, it moved her mouth and her feet. (laughs) I love that. It moved her mouth and her what? Yeah. This passage of scripture in the original language carries the idea that she said this to herself over and over again. The Amplified actually says it this way. In Mark 5, 28, it says, for she kept saying. And this is where the confession of the word of faith group kind of gets their idea of this, is to speak it over and over again. She, said, she kept saying to herself. Notice she didn't tell everybody around her. How many have ever noticed this? You can't tell everybody around you what you're believing because they don't believe. That's why you need a good faith church. You need somebody that will look at you and go, yeah, you're going to live and not die in the name of Jesus. People say, yeah, but we've experienced where people have died. What's that got to do with what Jesus said? I know it creates contradiction, and I get it. I know it creates in some people this fight within them, like, well, which is right? Well, let me go back to salvation again. Who's right on salvation? I'm talking about Jesus. When you're born again, was he right? How many have been born again? You know that you know that you're a child of the living God. Well, is he right in the rest? So let's not complicate it. Oh, Lord, you know. Come on. The Lord asked Ezekiel, can the bones live? And he said, oh, Lord, you know. And so when it comes to everything else, oh, Lord, you know. And I agree with you. I can feel fire coming on. Hallelujah. I want you, I don't care if your background's Presbyterian, Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, you know, whatever, Methodist, I don't care. We've had people show up because this used to be a Methodist building, and they go, is this a Methodist church? Well, it's a church. We love the Word of God. We preach the Word of God, and we love people and want to see God have everything in their lives that He's promised, manifesting. Have we seen it perfectly? My God, no. Have you seen everything perfectly in your life? But I'd sure hate to do the opposite of what Paul said. He said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't want to be stuck in a world where I don't have hope. Well, are all your circumstances perfect? No. Perfect? Perfect's when Jesus returns or we go there. But for now, I'm on the planet, and I'm all dressed up in some armor, and so are you. So you might as well go ahead and swing that sword and and use that shield and just go ahead and polish up and stick your chest out with the breastplate of righteousness, with your loins girt about with truth and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You might as well just go ahead and enjoy yourself while you're here and tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And people say, well, what if it falls apart? What if you end up in heaven tomorrow? Rejoice because you're coming back. It ain't over until Jesus says it's over. And we're not standing on anything. We're not standing on personalities. We're not standing on denominations. We're standing on this, the Word of God. And in this world, how many have noticed it, the, 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 there is less to trust in humanity today in governments, in, in, in businesses. The same demon that was working in Jesus' day is working today. And guess what you and I get to be? The mud the devil has to walk through until we're out of here and Jesus gets us out of here. And so for all the things that he's done evil to us, we get to go, ha, 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 ha. You have to try and go through us. As long as the church is here, the devil is going to be frustrated. He's tried so many times with globalism. And then something happens. God raises up a generation of people. And it goes south. That was just prophetic preaching is all that was. 
The Passion Translation of Mark 5, 28 says, For she kept saying in herself, glory to God. I'm sorry. Whew. This is just riding through me like... <laughs> I just know from experience. I was dead meat. And then I was alive meat. <laughs> you say, how did it happen? When I was 19 years old, I went to an altar and kneeled down and said, Jesus, you're it. I give my life to you. Lord, here's my credentials. Lord, this is what you're getting. This is amazing. <laughs> I said, Lord, I barely made it through high school. I know how to smoke weed. <laughs> Some people are like, what? I know how to drink and smoke weed at the same time. Lord, I know how to live like a devil. And I rejected you and hurt you and abused you. And, and I got a 2.47 grade point average out of high school. I've applied for no colleges. Nobody is giving me scholarships. I'm barely alive physically. And you've seen my friends and what we've done already at this church camp. Here I come. Yes, he did. He accepted me. <laughs> oh, devil. <laughs> he thought he had me. But God. And I you you go through it, you go, you go. And the Lord says, I got a plan for you, Sean. I knew you before you were ever born. I said, Lord, here I am. What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to preach. I went, are you sure? <laughs> I mean, look at the grade point average. You... <laughs> he said, I don't need your smarts. I need your yieldedness. I'll make you look smart. How many know he does it? Now, some people are like, I don't know, Sean. You might want to work out. <laughs> He'll, listen, the anointing comes and a donkey can look good. The fire of God can hit a donkey and rebuke a prophet. <laughs> uh, and you say, what have you been doing all these years since then? Just rolling around in grace. Trying to believe God every step of the way. Watching Him come through when I did it right and when I did it wrong. Enjoying the empowerment and the mercy. Both sides. Yeah. And the same goes for you. Same God in you. Same God on your life. Same God in your world. All you have to do is get with Him and get quiet and get by yourself and go, God... What do you want to do? And then, then this is what comes up inside you when this happens. And this is what the enemy does. He'll come to you and go, well, you can't do it because of this, and you can't do it because of this. And like Herb taught this morning out of, out of uh, uh, the life of Gideon, you'll find yourself uh, pressing wine and grapes in a, in a, in a, uh, in a or sh I'm sorry, wheat in a wine press. See, I told you, he can use anybody. That should be an encouragement to all of you. <laughs> Pretty soon, I'll have Moses in the ark. <laughs> and Noah will be getting rid of Pharaoh. <laughs> but if it's all by faith, <laughs> we can get the names mixed up. We can get it all backwards. But if you believe God, God will go, that's good enough. I see what you mean. Here, let's do it. I think I could run an aisle right now. I... That's good enough if you'll just believe me. I don't care if you just say it just right and you get all the structure of the sentence just right, all of that. He doesn't care. He's looking at our heart, our faith. 
Well, you don't understand. I'm addicted to cigarettes. So what? Get to God. I heard a minister say this years ago. A man came to him. And he said, I've been addicted to cigarettes and I don't know what to do. And he looked at the man, he said, I've had, he looked at the ministry, he said, I've had people pray for me. I've had people lay hands on me. He said, I don't know how many packs of cigarettes I've thrown out. I don't know what to do. And people say, why are you picking on cigarettes? Okay, I'll pick on the other drug that the church loves, worry. Because it's worse than cigarettes. I'd almost recommend that you give up worry and pick up cigarettes. I want to scrub that from the internet. We would... <laughs> I would... Cause worry's worse. How many are raised around worry? It's like, man, get that devil out of my life in the name of Jesus. The man said, "I've thrown him away. Don't tell me to throw him away. I've tried everything." And the man looked at him and said, "I'm not going to tell you to throw him away." He said, I'm not going to tell you not to, uh, not to smoke anymore. He said, every time you light up a cigarette, say, I don't need these. Every time. I'm not addicted to these. I don't need these. I remember my grandpa on my mom's side, my mom's dad, he smoked a pipe. You know, they came, on the, they came over on the ship from Denmark. So he smoked a pipe. I loved it because I love the sm- I'm talking about as a kid. I love the smell of the pipe. How many have ever smelled tobacco? You know, that, and it's like it doesn't smell bad. You know, it's not great for your lungs. But, but he would try everything to quit. He, show, he had these things behind his ears put in one time. I had no idea what it was for. But it was supposed to help him quit smoking. I don't know if it was an acupuncture thing or what. He tried everything. He could not quit smoking. It just didn't do it. Well, I didn't know the word. Of course, I'm a kid. I didn't know the word of faith then. But I'd have told him, if I knew, just start doing this. And God, over time, with this gentleman, I think it took two or three weeks. And he came back to the minister and he said, I haven't had a cigarette in a week. And I have no desire. Why? He spoke. Your tongue is leading you. Your tongue is leading you. No, no, listen to me. Whether you realize it or not, your tongue is leading you. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, it led her. Verse 30 says this, Mark 5, 30. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Who touched my clothes? Verse 31, but his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? See, they're in the natural. He's in the spirit. Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. You say, why was she fearing and trembling? Because she stole a healing. She pickpocketed Jesus. (laughs) I love the way the Holy Ghost runs this through my mind. I mean, I see it. I'm honestly, I see it like 30 seconds before you hear me say it. I see it. It just comes through. It's interesting. Anyway. (laughs) He took a healing from Jesus. Now, I love what Jesus, look at Jesus' response to her and to you and me. He said to her, daughter, your, has made you go in and be or whole of your affliction. He didn't say, give me that back. You're not good enough. What did Jesus emphasize here concerning her healing? Your now, let me ask you a question. How many years of Bible school do you think the woman of issue, with the issue of blood had? She just heard about Jesus and faith that quick. Say it with me. Say, I can believe, I can believe that, quick. that quick. 
Come on, you get healed in your body right now. Right where you're at. You say, how? Just touch his garment. Ooh. Just grab. That, just reach out in faith. This lady didn't even ask. I mean, we can't ask. But this lady didn't even ask. She just said. Where are you going today? How many know if she would have told her friends, because these weren't the, her friends weren't the ones that took the paralytic on the roof and, and let him through. They would have said, no, 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 sister. Be, be, use wisdom. You're bleeding constantly. Do you really think you should go out and walk among a crowd and press through it to touch Jesus? A lot of times in the church, what we call wisdom is nothing more than natural human wisdom. It's not the wisdom of God. It doesn't make sense to get up out of your, you need to rest, they may tell. And there's a time to rest. You understand what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is, what did she do? She heard, and something in her heart went, nope, this changes today. I got an answer now. These doctors haven't been able to do anything. God bless them. They have all my money. I ain't getting that back from them. Okay? So... But I got to go, I got to go touch this Jesus. And then she did, and then she got her healing. And technically, according to the law, she shouldn't even have been in there. That's why, part of the reason why she was afraid. Because she thought, I'm going to get in trouble because the law says as a bleeding woman, I can't be in the town. I can't be around these people because I'm unclean. And Jesus just looked at her and said, you're what? Faith has made you well. And if her faith can make her, well, our faith can make. Go in peace. I love this too, the, the way that Jesus expresses this. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Go in peace. Go in wholeness. In other words, Jesus is saying, be restored in everything that you lost. Which could mean the money too. People say, oh, no, no, Jesus wouldn't do that. Yes, Jesus would do that. Jesus, no, Jesus doesn't care about money. He doesn't want people to have money. Like I've said before, then you give me all yours. You're like, don't touch my money. <laughs> it's interesting. I was, uh, I'm not going to get on money, but I want to share this one thing. I was in the assembly of God, bless him, I love him, for years in uh did ministry with them and stuff, and I disagree with things, but they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's fine. And they would talk about, you know, the the uh, you know that God would never uh, take up you know an offering the way certain people did, and he they didn't believe in in biblical prosperity and stuff like that, and and all this stuff. But I'd watch them take the longest offerings I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> do you know? I actually had a friend of mine come through here because we don't do offering on Wednesday night. We don't. I don't take an offering every service. And to be honest with you, the reason why I don't is because I get tired of it. You say, what do you mean? Being offering to death. If you can't manage your money and bring the offering on the day that we take the offering, then you're in trouble. And you got worse issues with your money than I could ever fix. <laughs> People say, well, you'll get more money. No, I won't. It's not even me anyway. You'll give to God... I know I'm meddling. Just hang on. You'll give to God. You'll give to God according to what's in your heart. That's why I say if you can't give here, you better give somewhere. That the Lord leads you. Because he's trying to get a blessing to you. He's not trying to extract something out of you. How many know if God really wanted to, he could extract everything out of everything? So anyway, they would take the longest, and they'd make fun of me because they'd say, look, you don't got to do this. You can believe God for me. You can't believe God for money. You can't believe God that he'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. <laughs> I'd show them the scripture, you know. It's like, no, no, that's not. Okay, fine. I'll just go on crazy and provided for. Whoops. I'll go on crazy and provided for, and you can go on taking four-hour offerings. I'm not going to take an offering, so don't. So 
So it says this, that your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus said to her, said her faith made her well. So in this series, we are looking at the language of faith. This testimony here in Mark is a great example of the power of faith in the heart and in the mouth. We see the process here, so let's break it down again. She heard about Jesus and received it as truth. She said out of her mouth what she wanted and then walked and pressed through the crowd to receive her miracle. And then lastly, when it comes to faith in this life, there will always be things that you must press through in order to receive. Doubt and unbelief are going to come to you, but you have to reject those and speak in line with truth. Yeah, but I don't feel faith. Faith is not a feeling. It's a belief. Well, it doesn't feel like it's happening. Faith is not a feeling, it's a belief. It's a conviction, a knowing on the inside. How are you going to make it through? I don't know exactly the detail how, I just know I'm going to make it through and God's going to get glory in my life. This tells us that if we will do the same, we can have the same results. Full faith in God rests completely on God's word alone. All right, let's wrap up in Mark 11. Go over to Mark 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse number 12. Mark 11, chapter, uh, or uh, sorry, Mark chapter 11, verse number 12. And I'll pick up my papers. I got to not set those in there. Sorry, live stream. That's not good etiquette, is it, Josh? <laughs> He's on me sometimes. Like, you, can't, you can't turn around, John. When <laughs> Mark chapter 11, verse number 12 says this. Now the next day, we're going to see the operation of faith. When they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Verse 13, and seeing from afar a fig tree, this is Jesus, having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. Verse 14. In response, Jesus... What? Said to what? Jesus spoke to a fig tree. How many have trees in your yard? How much talking do you do to them? I don't recommend the words he's about to speak, but, you know... Yeah. Well, you're crazy. Careful what you say about Jesus. Is Jesus crazy here? I thought he only did what he saw his, and he only, what he heard his father. What if that governed my life 24-7? I think I'd have a lot less talking. You know, people don't understand this. I'm talking about the church, but especially the world. They do not understand this principle. They think, well, I just live in reality. And whatever I see and feel, that's reality. As believers, that is not reality. Actually, what we don't see naturally and feel naturally is more real than what we see naturally. You say, how could that be? Well, we are eternal. We are eternal. We are spirits. You know, the world, the, uh, the world has, you know, how many have seen Marvel movies and stuff like that? Doctor Strange and, and stuff like that. They, they separate, they talk about the multiverse and they separate the body from the that's just, they've just stolen from God. Did you know that? You're a spirit. You're going to slip right out of your body when you die and go to heaven. There'll be an angel standing there. And you'll go, oh. You know, a lot of Christians will go, I didn't even know you guys were real. <laughs> but they believe in, you know, Marvel. Marvel. They do. They have more faith in magic than they do in Jesus. 
the realm of the spirit's real. And if you're not going to control what you say, you'll manifest it and you'll be frustrated if you don't filter it through the word. Jesus, John the Baptist made a statement. I love this. These, oh, I just love these statements. They wreck natural thinking. John the Baptist, who's older physically than Jesus, by six months, watches Jesus walk by and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And then looks at his disciples and stuff and says this, Before I was, he is. What? Now, what if I did that? I'm older, than, I'm older than Heidi. What if I said, behold, she was before me. You would call me. You, we did this in grade school. Didn't you do this in grade school? You know, I'd, I'd look at my friend and go. They're crazy. You know, it wasn't in high school. You know, we were way beyond that in high school. <laughs> but this is how God thinks. God actually has my answers logged for every problem already before I even get there. It's already done. That's why you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover because the healing's already provided. <laughs> People say, no, i got to get God to heal me. Nope, he's already done it. You have to receive it. What? Yeah, do, well, do you want him to go back to the cross again? See, he doesn't have to do it again. He already did it. Amen? So, verse 14, uh, in response, Jesus said to the fig tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. So he actually let them in on the conversation with the tree. Verse 15, so they came to Jerusalem, then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. So Jesus spoke to the tree, goes into the temple, and has a revival meeting. Listen, this is Jesus' revival meeting. He will do this. People say, oh no, God won't do that. Yes, he will. He'll do it. We get too religious, he'll come in and rearrange the furniture. <laughs> he will. He'll go, I don't like this chair here, and he'll just throw it. <laughs> People go, that was my favorite seat. And he goes, that's my point. You're too comfortable. We need to change things up. Then he taught saying to them after he made a mess of the place. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. Verse 18. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Verse 19. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Verse 20. Now in the morning. So what has happened? He spoke. He went to the temple. It's been all night. Now they're back in the morning, walking back the way that they came in. Do you get that? Okay. They passed by and saw the fig tree, what? From the roots. I love this. This to me speaks of soul issues in us. Rooted things can be spoken to and up, uprooted. Things that are fruitless. You get that? that to me, this speaks of the soul of a believer, the mind, will, and emotions. Things that are entrenched or rooted in us. We talked about worry earlier. Fear. Stuff that we don't naturally know how to stop doing. It takes faith to uproot these things. It takes the power of the resurrection. Verse number 21. It says, And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have what? Faith in God. So what does faith in God do? It speaks. The faith of God speaks. Now watch. Hear me now. Those of you that don't have a strong background in this, because this may be my one shot at you. Listen. How did God create 
the world. He spoke from his and created. People say, yeah, well, that's God. Well, I'm about to show you where God tells you to do the same thing. He says this, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. And the, the actual Greek there or in this particular verse says, have the faith of God. But it says this, verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his, so out of the abundance of the heart, but believes that those things he will be done. He will, or she will, that's genderless, will have whatever they say. Mm, that felt good in my heart. I will have what I... So the more of this that is in you, the more the Holy Spirit has to pull from for speech. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth leaks. Yeah, speaks. Come on. Speaks. Speaks. You'll change what you say about you. Now, I'm not just talking about circumstances. I'm talking about you. You won't go, oh God, how could you ever... How could you ever use a person like me? Oh God, this situation is so far gone. There's no hope. I relapsed again. Come on. Now people say, relapsed on what? I don't care, Mountain Dew. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever could control you. In most cases in the church, it's relapsed on worry. Unforgiveness. Come on. You know, we talk about addictions. These are addictions in the church. People are like, well, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. I hope you don't go with a girl that chews. All right, but anyway, that'd be weird. So, but yet you're addicted to gossip. Yes, this is the metal portion of the service, again, where I meddle. The Lord just wants that, but you're addicted to bad mouthing. I'm not talking about legitimately looking at something and assessing a situation. I'm talking about you just have unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart toward people, which is really a contradiction because you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's actually not in your spirit. It's in your soul. It's all locked up in there. But you don't know what they did to me 25 years ago. Well, you can understand what they did 25 years ago. You can understand maybe that they haven't earned the trust that they do should have in your life to be able to come back in and have full relationship with you. That's understandable. But you cannot harbor bitterness and exercise strong faith. It's impossible. Come on, we've talked about this before, and I'm about to quit right now. But uh, we've talked about this before. We've said this before. You, in your own family, you do this. You assess, those of you that have parents, you assess where your kids need correction. But you're not cursing them. You just recognize where they need to be corrected and developed. You're not saying their future will never happen. You're saying, if I don't correct this, their future will never happen. That God has designed. People say, oh, no, 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 that's speaking curses. It is not speaking curses. It's speaking blessing. Do you know that the Lord actually, a, a corrective word from the Lord to align our thinking and our lifestyle to his word and the reality of who he is in us is actually speaking a blessing? That's why I correct my kids. Do you correct your kids? People are like, my kids are grown. Well, then you're past that stage. People say, well, they're, they're in this place now where they're... Well, you got prayer. You've got relationship, hopefully. And if not, I'll just say this. The most powerful thing is dealing with it in the Spirit. Are you sure? I'm absolutely positive. The most powerful thing is dealing with it in the Spirit. It's the most powerful thing. 
But you, need, you and I need to realize this. That if we're going to see what God said, then we have to fill our hearts with what he said and then begin to say what he said. Well, I was taught just to be nice. I was never taught. I know a lot of believers, and they're wonderful believers, some of the best believers uh, in the sense of easy to be around. There are some denominations and groups that teach the fruit of the Spirit so well, and how many know that people that walk on a high level of the fruit of the Spirit are easy to be around? Even when they bring a word that kind of contradicts, it just comes so uh, powerfully and sweet, you just want to listen to it. Because uh, it's by the fruit of the Spirit. It's actually the Word of God by the fruit of the Spirit. But then some of these same believers are the most powerless against the devil in other areas. You say, why? Because they've never been taught who they are in Christ and the difference between what the devil's doing in their life and what God's doing in their their life. His will versus their will. All, All of that is just a big kind of thrown together mess of what we call and what people talk about as the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God can only be defined by Jesus. I said it. I know, I, I, I've been around this long enough to know. I know what people do when they've really been versed in certain things. In their mind, they go back over the Old Testament and they start pointing out things in the Old Testament where it says God destroyed this or God destroyed that. I'd challenge you, go back and read those passages and see why judgment came. Don't just look at Job's boils and forget about Jesus' stripes. People say, well, I'm, I'm God's judge. I had somebody tell me this recently. They, were, they, were, they came for help, but they wanted to lecture me on how they needed help. I'm like, why are you here? And you say, people do that all the time because of pride. If, if you come for help from somebody... Don't tell them what your help should be. Just by the nature that you came for help means you don't know what to do. I know it's just, I know people don't run the aisles on this one. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't, they're like, what, do you have to do this? Can we end on a high note? Go get the faith kids. We'll bring them back up. <laughs> Over the mountains. No, 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 I'm trying to save your life by telling you what Jesus said. People will come, they will come and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll have all these things that are going on in their life and I'm not condemning them at all. And they'll come and share about how the world, the world is just falling apart, that the enemy is just tearing their lives up through addiction and different things. And they'll talk about these things, but then they won't listen to the answer. They won't begin to change what they do. People say, well, yeah, you read those scriptures on words, but really what difference does it make in my life? None if you're going to say things like that. Well, I I had hands laid on me, so it's over. Listen, I've had hands laid on me thousands of times probably, and I never quit studying the word. I never quit coming to church. People say, you have to. It's your job. No, I don't have to. I could choose not to. I choose to. You say, what do you mean? I chose to quit hanging out with who I was hanging out with. I didn't lose my friends. I left them. Why? Because I found a friend that will stick closer than a brother. And that takes faith. Because your natural mind and your natural thinking loves the familiar. It loves the traditional. It lo- Even though... The traditional way that people live continues chaos in their life. It's familiar, and they go back to it. Why? Because they have not repented. We say, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to make that kind of commitment. Then you won't have that kind of freedom. <laughs> well, it's harsh, preacher. No, it's not harsh. It's just the truth. Now, I may say it too hard sometimes. Maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I know I have in my life at times. But the reality is when you correct your child, we talked about this. I think this was on a Wednesday night. Maybe it was on a Sunday. 
but I shared about how I was in a Bible study recently. This, you say, why are you doing this? I'll give you one quick example, and then I'm going to go back to this illustration. And I really will close if you stop listening. All right, so. <laughs> Some of you, how many of you, you're, you're getting something out of this. This is helping you. You're like, I've never heard preaching like this before. I thought they just read out of the Reader's Digest. All the younger people are going, what is a Reader's Digest? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mean your denomination doesn't send you the message in the mail a year in advance? No. I pray and hear from God, and that's what he says to teach, and that's what you hear. That's how we're supposed to live. Where was I at? Illustration. Got to get back to the illustration. Oh, yes, thank you. We were talking about compassion. We were in this Bible study. And this uh, couple was being, it was a small group. And so, and this was a church where I was the visitor. I didn't say anything during the Bible study much, believe it or not. And uh, this, this, this couple was talking about their child who they had raised in church who was now a drug addict or was. And how that they were taught uh, growing up, this child was taught compassion and love and all these things. And the parents understood love as much as they understood it and all these things. And the, when this child was going through the addiction, the father shared how that the child was able to manipulate him into giving uh, the child money for drugs by using the love of God and compassion. Now this goes on, guys, I'm just going to tell you this. This runs deeper than just, we use drugs. This runs way deeper than that. This happens with husbands and wives. I'm not talking about drugs. They manipulate to get what they want. Women and men both do it. You got to watch out for manipulation. It's a demonic thing. It's absolutely demonic. So anyway, this daughter or son, I don't remember which it was, would say, Dad, you raised me in church. You taught me to love people, and I need this money because I'm addicted to this drug. Now, I know this is a little more ex ex of an extreme example, but I'm trying to help you see the, the illustration of what's happening here. So he would give his child money for the drug out of what he thought was love. Can I ask you a question? Is helping your child... Be addicted to a drug, loving them. See, we know the answer is no. But out of emotion, do you give your child what they want instead of discipline that they need because you don't like the way you feel when they're upset? Because that's not how God operates. I'll give you an example. You say, do we have to go to parenting? Well, seems like a good example. <laughs> Minister said this years ago, I heard him talk about it. He said, there's a story about a mom who said to young Johnny, 12 years old, you have to clean up your room and your bathroom and have your bed made and everything in order, to, in order to come, when you come home from school, in order to have, play a half hour of video games. Johnny leaves, leaves uh, uh, goes to school, realizes, oh, no, I didn't do any of that. And he's dreading coming home because Johnny loves video games because he's a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> anyway, some of this goes for some of the 34-year-old boys that are here too. So <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> the video game controls you. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying, you know. Anyway, go, okay, moving on. He comes home, he goes upstairs, he thinks, well, maybe mom didn't see my room. And he gets into his room, and he sees the bed made, and a note from mom, I love you, son, and cookies with milk. And jo Johnny, what in the, everything's put together perfectly, and he gets to play video games for a half hour. And people think... And the, the, the minister said this. He said, what did Johnny learn? And people automatically say nothing. 
And that's not true. Johnny learned he doesn't have to do what he's supposed to do. And that there are no consequences to a wrong decision. People say, well, that's legalism. That's not grace. You're wrong. It is absolutely grace. The scripture says in Galatians, which is about as grace strong as you can get, whatever, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh destruction. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap from the spirit everlasting life. Amen? Do you see that? It is so important. And people say, well, I was just being merciful. You're being emotional in your love, not scriptural. See, truth has to function with love. Do you know you actually, you can have truth without love, but you can't actually have love without truth? Did you know that? And people say, well, the Lord would never do that. Yes, he'll absolutely do that. Now, he'll always provide grace and mercy if you come boldly. See, the reality is Johnny could have his video game back. It just won't be that day. There's another day tomorrow. And what did Johnny learn? I've got to do this. Otherwise, other things go wrong. So I'll put it to you like this. I say it this way. I can teach my kids to obey or the police can. The scripture says in Proverbs that if you don't discipline your child, you actually what? You hate them. You know, I mean, my kids have never said this to me, but maybe they have under their breath when I didn't hear. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but have you ever had a kid or heard of a kid? You know, they get disciplined by the parent. The parent says, you know, I'm doing this because I love you. And the kid says, well, I hate you. And parents will go, <gasps> they'll crumble. And my kid doesn't, doesn't, your kid has a kid head. You have an adult head. You should be able to manage your emotion. Amen. My kids do not determine my level of self-worth. Okay, I really got to meddling. Lord, we need a joke to end on a high note. Do you? <laughs> How many realize what we're talking about is truth? Why don't you stand? I know I didn't get back to the other illustration, but that's okay. I felt like that one needed to stick. Oh, I know exactly what the other illustration was. I'll share it with you real quick. You say, why do you go off on rabbit trails or those things? Because they're prophetic utterances. Do you think I went through that parenting thing for nothing? There are parents that are present here that need to hear it. How many were here last week when we took communion? Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to come up and confess all their parenting woes. That's just for you. Just take it and go with it and learn and, and apply it. Now, here's the thing. How many of you were last week during communion? Remember I got to preaching on the blood of Jesus and talking about salvation? Do you know nobody responded during the altar call at the end? But remember during that time I was saying, you can get born again right in your seat? Do you know what I had as a testimony right after the service? A young lady came up to me and said, I got born again in my seat while during communion. See, it may seem like to you some random whatever. No, no, no. I know exactly where I'm at in the river of the Spirit. I know exactly where I'm at. I've done this for 20 years. Spoke. You, how many, you know your car. You've had it for a long time. And you know the ins and outs of it. You know how it works, how it operates. You know, like uh, Herb talked about one time, he knew the actual noises of his car. <laughs> how many know, you know the noises of your car? You're like, when I start it, this is going to happen. When I break, this is going to happen. Well, when it comes to flowing with the Holy Spirit, you can become so familiar with Him and how He operates, you just actually go, yeah, yeah, let's go this way. How many have seen wind blow over a wheat field? You say, what's that got to do with the flow of the Holy Spirit? You're the wheat, He's the wind. Does the wheat fight the wind? Just goes with it. People say, I don't know. Are you born again? You know the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't know if I do. Then you say, Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to me. And he will, amen.